Section 7 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter 3 Captured by an American Vessel The Horrors of War. Read by John Greenman. Having joined the blockading fleet again, we led the same sort of life as before, now at anchor, then giving chase now standing in shore and anon standing out to sea firing and being fired at without once coming into action determined to accomplish some exploit or other our captain ordered an attempt to be made at cutting out some of the french small craft that lay in shore we were accustomed to send out our barges almost every night in search of whatever prey they might capture but on this occasion the preparations were more formidable than usual the oars were muffled the boat's crew increased and every man was armed to the teeth the cots were got ready on board in case any of the adventurers should return wounded cots are used to sleep in by wardroom officers and captains midshipmen and sailors using hammocks but a number of the cots are always kept in a vessel of war for the benefit of wounded men they differ from the hammock in being square at the bottom and consequently more easy Notwithstanding these expressive preparations, the brave fellows went off in as fine spirits as if they had been going on shore to enjoy themselves. Such is the contempt of danger that prevails among sailors. We had no tidings of this adventure until morning, when I was startled by hearing three cheers from the watch on deck. These were answered by three more from a party that seemed approaching us. I ran on deck just as our men came alongside with their bloodless prize, a lugger laden with French brandy, wine, and Castile soap. They had made this capture without difficulty, for the crew of the lugger made their escape in a boat on the first intimation of danger. Though without any positive information, we now felt pretty certain that our government was at war with America. Among other things, our captain appeared more anxious than usual. He was on deck almost all the time the lookout aloft was more rigidly observed, and every little while the cry of, "'Masthead there!' arrested our attention. It is customary in men of war to keep men at the fore and main mastheads, whose duty it is to give notice of every new object that may appear. They are stationed in the royal yards, if they are up, but if not, on the top-gallant yards. At night a lookout is kept on the foreyard only." thus we passed several days the captain running up and down and constantly hailing the man at the masthead early in the morning he began his charge to keep a good lookout and continued to repeat it until night indeed he seemed almost crazy with some pressing anxiety sunday december twenty fifth eighteen twelve came and it brought with it a stiff breeze we usually made a sort of holiday of this sacred day after breakfast it was common to muster the entire crew on the spar-deck, dressed as the fancy of the captain might dictate. Sometimes in blue jackets and white trousers, or blue jackets and blue trousers. At other times in blue jackets, scarlet vest, and blue or white trousers, with our bright anchor buttons glancing in the sun, and our black glossy hats ornamented with black ribbons, and with the name of our ship painted on them after muster we frequently had church service read by the captain the rest of the day was devoted to idleness but we were destined to spend the sabbath just introduced to the reader in a very different manner we had scarcely finished breakfast before the man at the masthead shouted sail ho the captain rushed upon deck exclaiming masthead there sir where away is the sail the precise answer to this question i do not recollect but the captain proceeded to ask what does she look like? A square-rigged vessel, sir, was the reply of the lookout. After a few minutes the captain shouted again, Masthead there, sir. What does she look like? A large ship, sir, standing toward us. By this time most of the crew were on deck, eagerly straining their eyes to obtain a glimpse of the approaching ship, and murmuring their opinions to each other on her probable character. Then came the voice of the captain, shouting, Keep silence, fore and aft. Silence being secured, he hailed the lookout, who, to his question of, What does she look like? replied, A large frigate bearing down upon us, sir. 
A whisper ran along the crew that the stranger ship was a Yankee frigate. The thought was confirmed by the command of, "'All hands clear the ship for action! Ahoy!' The drum and fife beat to quarters, bulkheads were knocked away, the guns were released from their confinement, the whole dread paraphernalia of battle were produced, and after the lapse of a few minutes of hurry and confusion, every man and boy was at his post, ready to do his best service for his country, except the band, who, claiming exemption from the affray, safely stowed themselves away in the cable-tier. We had only one sick man on the list, and he, at the cry of battle, hurried from his cot, feeble as he was, to take his post of danger. A few of the junior midshipmen were stationed below on the berth-deck, with orders given in our hearing to shoot any man who attempted to run from his quarters. As the approaching ship showed American colors, all doubt of her character was at an end. We must fight her, was the conviction of every breast. Every possible arrangement that could ensure success was accordingly made. The guns were shotted, the matches lighted, for although our guns were all furnished with first-rate locks, they were also provided with matches, attached by lanyards, in case the lock should misfire. A lieutenant then passed through the ship, directing the marines and boarders, who were furnished with pikes, cutlasses, and pistols, how to proceed if it should be necessary to board the enemy. He was followed by the captain, who exhorted the men to fidelity and courage, urging upon their consideration the well-known motto of the brave Nelson, England expects every man to do his duty. In addition to all these preparations on deck, some men were stationed in the tops with small arms, whose duty it was to attend to trimming the sails, and to use their muskets provided we came to close action. There were others also below, called sail-trimmers, to assist in working the ship should it be necessary to shift her position during the battle. My station was at the fifth gun on the main deck. It was my duty to supply my gun with powder, a boy being appointed to each gun in the ship on the side we engaged for this purpose. A woolen screen was placed before the entrance to the magazine, with a hole in it through which the cartridges were passed to the boys. We received them there, and, covering them with our jackets, hurried to our respective guns. These precautions are observed to prevent the powder taking fire before it reaches the gun. Thus we all stood, awaiting orders, in motionless suspense. At last we fired three guns from the larboard side of the main deck. This was followed by the command, "'Cease firing! You're throwing away your shot!' Then came the order to wear ship, and prepare to attack the enemy with our starboard guns. Soon after this I heard a firing from some other quarter, which I at first supposed to be a discharge from our quarter-deck guns, but it proved to be the roar of the enemy's cannon. A strange noise, such as I had never heard before, next arrested my attention. It sounded like the tearing of sails just over our heads. This I soon ascertained to be the wind of the enemy's shot. The firing, after a few minutes' cessation, recommenced. The roaring of cannon could now be heard from all parts of our trembling ship, and mingling as it did with that of our foes, it made a most hideous noise. By and by I heard the shot strike the sides of our ship. The whole scene grew indescribably confused and horrible. It was like some awfully tremendous thunderstorm whose deafening roar is attended by incessant streaks of lightning carrying death in every flash and strewing the ground with the victims of its wrath. Only in our case the scene was rendered more horrible than that by the presence of torrents of blood which dyed our decks. Though the recital may be painful, yet, as it will reveal the horrors of war, and show at what a fearful price a victory is won or lost, I will present the reader with things as they met my eye during the progress of this dreadful fight. I was busily supplying my gun with powder when I saw blood suddenly fly from the arm of a man stationed at our gun. I saw nothing strike him. The effect alone was visible. In an instant the third lieutenant tied his handkerchief round the wounded arm, and sent the poor fellow below to the surgeon. The cries of the wounded now rang through all parts of the ship. These were carried to the cockpit as fast as they fell, while those more fortunate men who were killed outright were immediately thrown overboard. As I was stationed but a short distance from the main hatchway, I could catch a glance at all who were carried below. A glance was all I could indulge in, for the boys belonging to the guns next to mine were wounded in the early part of the action, 
and I had to spring with all my might to keep three or four guns supplied with cartridges. I saw two of these lads fall nearly together. One of them was struck in the leg by a large shot. He had to suffer amputation above the wound. The other had a grape or canister shot sent through his ankle. A stout Yorkshireman lifted him in his arms and hurried him to the cockpit. He had his foot cut off, and was thus made lame for life. Two of the boys stationed on the quarter-deck were killed. They were both Portuguese. A man who saw one of them killed afterwards told me that his powder caught fire and burnt the flesh almost off his face. In this pitiable situation the agonized boy lifted up both hands as if imploring relief when a passing shot instantly cut him in two. I was an eyewitness to a sight equally revolting. A man named Aldridge had one of his hands cut off by a shot, and almost at the same moment he received another shot, which tore open his bowels in a terrible manner. As he fell, two or three men caught him in their arms, and as he could not live, threw him overboard. One of the officers in my division also fell in my sight. He was a noble-hearted fellow named Nan Kivel. A grape or canister shot struck him near the heart. He fell and was carried below, where he shortly after died. Mr. Scott, our first lieutenant, was also slightly wounded by a grummet or a small iron ring, probably torn from a hammock clue by a shot. He went below, shouting to the men to fight on. Having had his wound dressed, he came up again, shouting to us at the top of his voice, and bidding us fight with all our might. The battle went on. Our men kept cheering with all their might. I cheered with them, though I confess I scarcely knew for what. Certainly there was nothing very inspiriting in the aspect of things where I was stationed. So terrible had it been the work of destruction round us, that it was termed the slaughterhouse. Not only had we had several boys and men killed or wounded, but several of the guns were disabled. The one I belonged to had a piece of muzzle knocked out, and when the ship rolled it struck a beam of the upper deck with such force as to become jammed and fixed in that position. A twenty-four-pound shot had also gone through the screen of the magazine, immediately over the orifice through which we passed our powder. The schoolmaster received a death wound. The brave boatswain, who came from the sick cot to the din of battle, was fastening a stopper on a backstay which had been shot away when his head was smashed to pieces by a cannon-ball. Another man, going to complete the unfinished task, was also struck down. One of our midshipmen likewise received a severe wound, and the wardroom steward was killed. A fellow named John, who for some petty offense had been sent on board as a punishment, was carried past me wounded. I distinctly heard the large blood drops fall pat, pat, pat on the deck. His wounds were mortal. Even a poor goat, kept by the officers for her milk, did not escape the general carnage. Her hind legs were shot off, and poor Nan was thrown overboard. I have often been asked what were my feelings during this fight. I felt pretty much as I suppose every one does at such a time. That men are without thought when they stand amid the dying and the dead is too absurd an idea to be entertained for a moment. We all appeared cheerful, but I know that many a serious thought ran through my mind. Still, what could we do but keep up a semblance, at least, of animation? To run from our quarters would have been certain death from the hands of our own officers. To give way to the gloom or to show fear would do no good, and might brand us with the name of cowards, and ensure certain defeat. Our only true philosophy, therefore, was to make the best of our situation by fighting bravely and cheerfully. I thought a great deal, however, of the other world. Every groan, every falling man, told me that the next instant I might be before the judge of all the earth. While these thoughts secretly agitated my bosom, the din of battle continued. Grape and canister shot were pouring through our portholes like leaden rain, carrying death in their train. The large shot came against the ship's side like iron hail, shaking her to the very keel or passing through her timbers and scattering terrific splinters which did a more appalling work than even their own death-giving blows the reader may form an idea of the effect of grape and canister when he is told that grape-shot is formed by seven or eight balls 
confined to an iron and tied in a cloth. These balls are scattered by the explosion of the powder. Canister shot is made by filling a powder canister with balls, each as large as two or three musket balls. These also scatter with direful effect when discharged. What then with splinters, cannonballs, grape, and canister poured incessantly upon us, the reader may be assured that the work of death went on in a manner which must have been satisfactory even to the king of terrors himself. Suddenly the rattling of the iron hail ceased. We were ordered to cease firing. A profound silence ensued, broken only by the stifled groans of the brave sufferers below. It was soon ascertained that the enemy had shot ahead to repair damages, for she was not so disabled but she could sail without difficulty, while we were so cut up that we lay utterly helpless. Our head braces were shot away, the fore and main top masts were gone, the mizzen mast hung over the stern, having carried several men over in its fall. We were in the state of a complete wreck. A council was now held among the officers on the quarter deck. Our condition was perilous in the extreme. Victory or escape was alike hopeless. Our ship was disabled. Many of our men were killed, and many more wounded. The enemy would without doubt bear down upon us in a few moments, and as she could now choose her own position, would doubtless rake us fore and aft. Any further resistance was therefore folly. So, in spite of the hot-brained lieutenant, who advised them not to strike, but to sink alongside, it was determined to strike our colors. This was done by the hands of a brave fellow named Watson, whose saddened brow told how severely it pained his lion heart to do it. To me it was a pleasing sight, for I had seen fighting enough for one Sabbath, more than I wished to see again on a weekday. His Britannic Majesty's frigate Macedonian was now the prize of the American frigate United States. I now went below to see how matters appeared there. The first object I met was a man bearing a limb which had just been detached from some poor sufferer. Pursuing my way to the wardroom, I necessarily passed through the steerage which was strewed with the wounded. It was a sad spectacle, made more appalling by the groans and cries which rent the air. Some were groaning, others were swearing most bitterly, a few were praying while those last arrived were begging most piteously to have their wounds dressed next. The surgeon and his mate were smeared with blood from head to foot. They looked more like butchers than doctors. Having so many patients, they had once shifted their quarters from the cockpit to the steerage. They now removed to the wardroom, and the long table, round which the officers had sat over many a merry feast, was soon covered with the bleeding forms of maimed and mutilated seamen. I now set to work to render all the aid in my power to the sufferers. Our carpenter, named Reed, had his leg cut off. I helped to carry him to the afterward room. But he soon breathed out his life there, and then I assisted in throwing his mangled remains overboard. We got out the cots as fast as possible, for most of the men were stretched out on the gory deck. One poor fellow who lay with a broken thigh begged me to give him water. I gave him some. He looked unutterable gratitude, drank, and died. It was with exceeding difficulty I moved through the steerage. It was so covered with mangled men, and so slippery with streams of blood. There was a poor boy there crying as if his heart would break. He had been servant to the boatswain, whose head was dashed to pieces. Poor boy, he felt that he had lost a friend. I tried to comfort him by reminding him that he ought to be thankful for having escaped death himself. Here I also met one of my messmates, who showed the utmost joy at seeing me alive, for he said he had heard that I was killed. He was looking up his messmates, which he said was always done by sailors. We found two of our mess wounded. One was the Swede, Lockholm, who fell overboard and was nearly lost, as formerly mentioned. We held him while the surgeon cut off his leg above the knee. The operation was most painful to behold. The surgeon using his knife and saw on human flesh and bones as freely as the butcher at the shambles does on the carcass of a beast. Our other messmates suffered still more than the Swede. He was sadly mutilated about the legs and thighs with splinters. 
such scenes of suffering as i saw in that wardroom i hope never to witness again could the civilized world behold them as they were and as they often are infinitely worse than on that occasion it seems to me that they would forever put down the barbarous practices of war by universal consent most of our officers and men were taken on board the victor ship i was left with a few others to take care of the wounded my master the sailing master was also among the officers who continued in the ship most of the men who remained were unfit for any service having broken into the spirit room and made themselves drunk some of them broke into the purser's room and helped themselves to clothing while others by previous agreement took possession of their dead messmates property for my own part i was content to help myself to a little of the officers provisions which did me more good than could be obtained from rum what was worse than all however was the folly of the sailors in giving spirits to their wounded messmates since it only served to aggravate their distress the great number of the wounded kept our surgeon and his mate busily employed until late at night and it was a long time before they had much leisure i remember passing round the ship the day after the battle coming to a hammock i found some one in it apparently asleep i spoke he made no answer i looked into the hammock he was dead my messmates coming up we threw the corpse overboard that was no time for useless ceremony the man had probably crawled into his hammock the day before and not being perceived in the general distress bled to death o oh, war who can reveal thy miseries end of chapter three